thank you, Ismail, and thank you very much to the Mosaic Foundation for hosting this event. Um, I had no idea that when we were planning this event and I chose this date, it would coincide with uh, the ominous and transformative events that we've been watching, uh, not only today, but over the last two weeks. As everyone knows, the last US um, um, aircraft um, exited um, Afghanistan airspace a few hours ago, bringing an end to um, America's longest war. Um, roughly 2,500 Americans were killed in that war, about 1,000 Allied troops and over uh, 240,000 Afghans uh, lost their lives in this 20-year period. Um, and there's no doubt that this is a, a world transformative event. Um, I've described it um, in some of my writings as uh, a complete uh, defeat for the United States, a humiliating defeat, arguably on par with the uh, Vietnam War, perhaps uh, worse. And I can't think of a better person to um, engage me in a conversation than uh, Imran Qureshi, my longtime uh, friend, collaborator, colleague, um, whose mind I deeply respect and who's been following the events of the last uh, uh, several weeks as intensely as, uh, as I have. And so I want to begin uh, by just saying, uh, before I pose the first question to Emron, let me just announce to everyone what the format is going to be. Uh, we want to wrap this event up in roughly an hour. So the plan and the division of labor is that Emron and I will have a you know, conversation uh, for about half an hour, and then we'll try and open the floor to questions and answers. Um, uh, we'll try and perhaps get uh, get people, instead of posting questions, to just unmute themselves if possible. And... Um, and uh, pose a question. If that's not possible, we'll just go to the, the chat function. So, uh, Emron, let me ask the big, broad question. Take uh, you know several minutes to to answer it. Uh, it's the title of this event. You know, looking back over the last twenty years, uh, what went wrong in Afghanistan? How can we politically, uh, intellectually, uh, socially, economically, and historically explain um, this colossal defeat? not only for the United States, but I would argue for the West at large. Could you paint us a picture um, of these transformative events that we've all been watching over the last several weeks? Um, thank you, Nader, for this kind and generous introduction. And I've all, also learned a, a lot from you over the past years, and you've challenged me and stretched me. I also want to thank Mosaic uh, for uh, organizing this event and um, your goals of you know, supporting human diversity are so important. And it's kind of tragic that we're talking about uh, Mosaic is sponsoring this event. And one of the most diverse societies on the face of this planet is Afghanistan, which was uh, the, the historic crossroads of the Silk Road. And, and there's such a wonderfully diverse group of people that span, you know, ethnicities, religious sects, and one of the great museums of the world is in the national is the National Museum of Kabul, which ranks up there with Western um, museums. But people don't really know. So to get to your question, Nader, um, I think that this is a, a transformative mom moment, and that's a, an abused word. But um, uh, I kind of frame this as really uh, the moment where we're seeing in a Eurasian future with China ascendant and American power clearly in decline or collapsing. And it resembles at some level for me, at least the transition at the end of the Second World War between an exhausted Great Britain and an emergent American power. And this is a watershed epochal moment in global history. I'm gonna take about 10 minutes, unfortunately, to go through my thoughts. I'm, I'm not as uh, uh, able, unlike you, to kind of go through thoughts uh, and pull them together uh, at, a, at a moment's notice. So I just want to make sure that I don't lose the gist of my argument. But you, you, you raised something. Today, August 30th, is a really important day in Afghan history. So there are two news items. One was on my Twitter feed around 4 p.m. U.S. and Taliban sources say that the last flight of the U.S. forces took off from Kabul airport. It meant the end of 20 years of, and the person that tweeted this said, U.S. presence in Afghanistan, in quotes. And so... Um, it's, it's, it is a moment. And the second news item they're going to raise is also um, something that provoked response from Afghan, um, Afghan journalists on social media. It was White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said, she referred to a drone strike that wiped out an Afghan family in Kabul as, quote, successful. And this is really a masterclass on how the U.S. lost the war in Afghanistan. 
and was simultaneously tone deaf. And the facts are, uh, this is a sidebar to the talk. The facts are that 10 members of a family in Kabul were killed, including seven children. And drone strikes killed an incredibly large number of Afghan civilians and traumatized the survivors. They also turned large segments of the population against the foreigners who sent those drones. The U.S. claimed that it struck ISIS, Islamic State, uh, Khorasan, ISK. An Afghan journalist, Ali Latif, Latifi, reported that he went to the house where 10 family members, including six children, were killed by a U.S. drone strike, and that tragically they had been issued with special visas and were about to leave the country. Another Afghan journalist, uh, Bilal Sarwari, who I really like, was, wrote about the, uh, the U.S. drone strike, saying, a never-ending tragedy for the people of Afghanistan and for the Americans, an epic fail, failure. Emma, let me just stop you. Emma, let me just stop you there, so everyone knows the, the the event that you're referring to. This is a drone strike that took place yesterday in Afghanistan, right. allegedly targeting an ISIS member. But uh, ten members of one family were killed in Kabul, including six children, the youngest one being two years of age. That's the event that you're talking about. Not everyone yes. knows about that because it's relatively okay, so new. So I just wanted to clarify. It. Okay, so good. So we'll we'll go into the gist of this, and so. Um, on Sunday, August 15, 2021, Taliban troops entered Kabul. Nashrif Ghani resigned and fled Afghanistan, and the 20-year experiment in Republican Democratic rule was over. Michael Semple, a former EU deputy to the Special Representative for Afghanistan from 204 to 207, spoke to a Kabul University professor who said, I cannot believe that 20 years of effort to install the values of a civilized society can end in the return of the brutes. So what we've seen is shock and disbelief that the Taliban have returned. So what's what's taken place? What's taken place is that uh, when we think of this moment, we think of this as really as an intelligence failure among American elites, among the military elites. It's more of a failure of policy or to be precise American policymakers, both liberal and conservative, democratic and Republican, uh, among basically what we call in the US the best and the brightest. And it speaks to their inability to understand local realities and develop real, realistic policy. And it mirrors past failures in Vietnam and past counterinsurgency efforts in Algeria. So what, what took place? Um, what took place was a very broad, broad policy that root took place within the Trump administration in September 2018. It basically, the, the Trump administration decided to bypass the Afghan government entirely and to negotiate with the Taliban directly. And the Taliban soon learned that they could have it all. They, they strung the Americans along and as a confidence building measure, they asked the Afghan government to release some 5,000 Taliban fighters who then returned and entered the battlefield. And these negotiations symbolically and practically weakened the Afghan government by cutting it out of all negotiations. And the Taliban used the negotiation for propaganda saying the U.S. is negotiating with us and we're going to win in the end. So they would appear on television from Doha saying they represent citizens' rights and will be inclusive. But their, their goal has all along been to seize power and to establish an Islamic emirate. And we can debate this, not there, because I know there's, there's a sense that this is a, a, a moment of Taliban 2.0, but I want to kind of set the stage for my argument, and then we can kind of take it from there. While the Taliban talk, leadership talked power sharing in Doha, it told its fighters that they defeated the U.S., and the U.S. agreed to hand over power to them. As they said, the Americans have handed over the keys of the presidential power. The agreement with the U.S. also curtailed the use of American air power against the Taliban. It effectively meant the Taliban employed, enjoyed complete freedom of movement and used that to increase the number of fighters to build up military pressure. They launched their final offensive in mid-May in 2021. It was well-organized and funded. And it also exploited the failures of the Afghan state. By at this point, there is now basically zero cooperation between the Afghan and the U.S., the Taliban targeted government-held administrative districts, and contrary to public, public assertions by Biden and others, men did resist fighting to the end uh, until suicide bombers breached their police station walls. There's also local failures such as the Afghan leadership of the military. Incredibly, there is no defense minister for the past two years. 
and there was micromanagement from the top down, unlike the Taliban commanders who had wide latitude to act. As well, civilian oversight was incredibly corrupt. And by that, I mean that the, the basis of appointments to the military were patronage based and competent officers were excluded and tribal bro power brokers and militias were not able to resist. So effectively for about two years, there's no um, military leadership and the, the Americans had excluded the Afghan state in negotiations with the Taliban. So this collapse was a perfect storm. And the outcome was, as you point out, uh, effectively American um, policy put it effectively in place the Taliban government, which was not their goal. And, and, and the big fear globally is that this will be replicated elsewhere. So the, the, the Chinese state has, has said to the Taiwanese that you will be betrayed by the Americans as the Americans you know, left Afghanistan. So it's using Afghanistan as a proxy and as a warning to, the, to Taiwan. So the question that we raise now going forward is, will the Taliban be different? It's truly to definitively say they have been meeting with uh, members of minority groups. They have been meeting with uh, members of the Karzai administration. However, to Michael Semple, they appear identical to the 1994 Taliban. Pakistani and Taliban commentators themselves call, themselves, call them the Taliban 2.0. So at a, at, a, at a rhetorical level, there is a kind of rebranding, but at, at, at a... At a uh, in local levels, there are summary executions taking place of journalists, of, of opposition figures, and, and those that aren't being covered. So there's no credible amnesty right now. So um, the point that I'm trying to make is there's the rhetoric at, at the central level, and then on the field, there's something else that's taking place. The other point that I want to make about the Taliban is that it's largely a sectarian Pashtun ethnic organization, as the late Iqbal Ahmed would point out to us repeatedly. So there's no real members of other ethnic communities that are part of the Taliban, except, except some marginal decorative figures. If that's to change, that's for the positive. But if we look at the inclusion of Uzbeks, Hazars, and Tajiks, there's pretty, criti pretty credibly nil participation. Now, we're gonna have to see what happens. The, the Taliban are claiming they don't want to monopolize power they told negotiators they don't want to create an Islamic emir in which all power resides with the emir, with emir, but effectively their past structures have been highly centralized. So the fear is among commentators like Michael Semple, whose engagement with Afghanistan dates back to 19, 1988, and he was fired by, by the previous Afghan administration for being too cozy with the Taliban. His basic argument was that they needed to negotiate a peace deal. And his, his argument has been that there may be an advisory council of ulama that the Taliban themselves select, but that what we're seeing right now is the start of a new chapter in Afghan politics and possibly a new revolution. That is the, the state that will be uh, run by the Taliban might meet fierce popular resistance. So we also see some power struggles within the Taliban. There's the faction in Kandahar, the faction of Peshawar, and then there's the desire to consolidate. And when you leave out, I'm going to say this rhetorically, 95% of the population, it makes them very vulnerable and very isolated and nearly impossible to consolidate. But you want to say something, I, I sense that there's a, a point that you want to make. No, go no. ahead. Finish your presentation. I have I have uh, several questions I'll ask you, but finish your presentation. Okay. So, so what does this mean for for your for the European Union and, and the United States? There's no evidence that the Taliban are going to take any action against transnational jihadi movements. Uh, Al Qaeda is still on the border. You have Islamic State, which is um, Khorasan, which is in a more or less an internecine feud with with the Taliban, and now potentially Afghanistan is going to be a source of of migrant refugees to the European Union. So Western powers are gonna to have to find some way in which to maintain pressure on the Taliban and some way of engaging them. And, and that way basically right now is that um, financial support. And so when we look at this moment right now, we need to think about 
where we're at. We're, we're basically at this moment where the Taliban have no capacity to sustain the economy and society. They've taken over during an economic, acute economic crisis. And um, we also know that in the past, uh, this, this regime was the, 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 the Ghani regime and the Karzai regime was propped up by the West. So roughly 80% of its medical bill for its citizens was paid by foreign donors. So this is a point of leverage for the West. Afghanistan to survive will require Western donor support. China can't fill the vacuum. Pakistan is also virtually hand to mouth. And you, you have at this moment, roughly the numbers are 10 million Afghans that are food, that are food insecure and seven mil, several million internally displaced. Uh, the UNHCR basically reported right now that there's some 270,000 newly displaced this year due to conflict and that there's an imminent humanitarian crisis. And so the, when you look at the numbers, uh, there are roughly 3.5 million people displaced internally in Afghanistan today and more than 2.5 million Afghan refugees in Iran and Afghanistan and Pakistan out of a population of about 38.1 million people. So um, the resilience of, the, of, this, of, the, of these people have been pushed to the limit by conflict and also COVID in the backdrop. So um, we have a, a population that's roughly 65% uh, young and, and, and children and they will need to be fed and you will need a functional state and this is some means of leverage of the West. And so it, uh, that leverage has to be used. So um, I'll kind of, uh, I'll end now because I'll, 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 I guess we'll, we'll go through a Q and A back and forth, but, but the backdrop that I want to make was that uh, by necessity, we'll need a functional state. Uh, some observers like Semple feel that they're not up to the task. And there's a, a, a looming humanitarian crisis that, um, that's um, uh, basically uh, uh, that will require some semblance of a functional state. So uh, I'll, I'll, Thanks, I'll, I've left out any discussion of the ideology of Pakistan, of China. Of we'll get to I that. I mean, so, so we'll, we'll, we'll address it in the Q&A. We'll get to that. Let me, let me um, play the role that I'm often comfortable playing, and that is of agent provocateur or devil's advocate. There are some people who I think uh, will argue very soon that the uh, defeat of the United States in Afghanistan after 20 years and after $2 trillion um, reflects a defeat of Western liberal democratic values. Uh, it just doesn't work uh, in certain parts of the Islamic world. Um, after that investment, the forces of sectarianism, of tribalism, of Islamic fundamentalism, uh, walked into Kabul without firing a shot. So the question is, does this defeat uh, that we're witnessing today and over the last several weeks, uh, does it represent a defeat of liberal democratic values? Well, it, it reflects the um, critique first and foremost of uh, American, what we call the meritocratic elite, you know, the, the folks that go to Ivy League universities and inhabit the, pol uh, the, the quarters of power, whether they be Republican and Democrat, informing policy and understanding local issues. And so um, in the last 20 years, um, what I did not realize, I, I became interested in Afghanistan uh, around the time when the, the Taliban took over in 19... 96, but I started paying attention to them in 1999 when I visited Iqbal Ahmed and he started talking about them between 1997 and 1999. And so what the argument that's being made about Western democratic values being alien are simply not true and risible. So what's happened over the past 20 years is that uh, is in spite of the failures of the Karzai and the Ghani regime, this government was the most liberal towards uh, women in any other period of Afghan history. So women had more rights, they've enjoyed human rights and in principle minority rights as well. So at some level, we saw a flourishing of men and women, uh, educated men and women that cared deeply about their society. And so um, it's not so much a question about liberal values not being uh, organically rooted in the Islamic tradition, but uh, a corrupt state that could not uh, 
rise to the challenge of doing the one thing that the state is to do to protect its citizens. The, 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 the preeminent philosopher of Western philosophical thought is, is, is Hobbes and his book is The Leviathan. And the Coles Note version is the state has one job, the Leviathan is to protect its citizens. It could not do that. And so the question is, is this a failure of the state? Is this the failure of the, clep the kleptocracy at that level? Uh, a failure of the, the Americans to understand local realities. I remember when I was at the Kennedy School, I, I attended all of the briefings and the lectures on Afghanistan, and you'd had, um, you'd had people coming in with PowerPoint slide decks uh, with Microsoft project plans that began with <laughs> begin nation building and end nation building and the level of hubris the fact that they couldn't speak the language, they'd never been there, yeah. they knew nothing about the people, was 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 going to root this project in failure. But we also saw the rise of an el uh, educated uh, elite in Kabul uh, and, and, and a diaspora movement. So I, I, I think the premise is the premise is um, flawed. I mean, there's a variant of that that liberal democracies and retreat, retreat globally. In, in the West as well too. So um, uh, there are challenges at every moment, but but the question is, um, are these values not consonant with Islamic traditions? And, and the answer is, uh, this is conjecture and this is um, kind of stereotyping. Um, if you were to talk to Afghans and ask them, do you support the idea of democracy? Do you believe that their daughters and their sisters and their wives should have equal rights and should go to university and to school and have access to healthcare, the vast majority would say yes. What happened was the people that were very, very uh, well versed in using violence seized power. Um, if I could, let me just push you a little bit on that. I know you're not a, you know, um, a, a military planner or a, um, or a, you know, a, an expert in um, nation building and in state building, but if we could turn the clock back 20 years and do things differently in Afghanistan, and by we, I mean the West, the United States, um, could you focus on a few points um, uh, that, that could be done differently, that should have been done differently, that could have produced a different outcome? I think the first thing is um, their counterinsurgency program uh, among uh, people like Petraeus that I heard speak at, at Harvard was actually effectively an insurgency creation program. So the level of hubris and ignorance, and I, I would see them come in and talk at the Kennedy School and they'd talk about their slide deck and the kill, the kill, the, the kills that were going up and that they were eliminating the Taliban. And, um, uh, and so number one, the counterinsurgency program created an insurgency. So drone strikes were a very bad idea. Number two, to, to really have, fought at that moment of, of power. So if we, if we take Machiavelli, Niccolo Machiavelli, another great Western philosopher seriously, it was at that moment of between 2001 and 2003 or four that you, you, you then engage in nation building, like really, really forcefully and say, look, you've been defeated. We're gonna build a national government, a unity government that's inclusive. Um, then and you bring them into the tent so they're, they're not shooting and attempting to destroy the state. So creating a, 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 a state, creating, uh, uh, minimizing the, the death of citizens at the hands of foreigners, which is how Afghans viewed it. Increasingly that, that, that insurgency, counter insurgency program created the actual Taliban. So those two strap, steps along with um, a, a credible Afghan National Army. I remember in around 2004, 2005, um, Canada, Canada, I'm a Canadian, and Canada had a role in Afghanistan, and it was responsible for Kandahar province. And the Canadian rep came in to talk, and she spoke at the faculty club, and of course, it's a free meal, so I went. And, and when she, it's, uh, so she spoke, and Roger Edward Owen, uh, who's a, a very great, um, Middle Eastern historian introduced her. And I asked her a couple of very naive questions. I, I, I kind of, in a very jocular way said, 
how much is the Canadian government giving to the Taliban? And she was outraged by that question. She said, we're not giving a cent. We are audited. This is a government organization. We will not give a cent to a terrorist organization. But the point that I was trying to make was that the Taliban are like the Sicilian mafia on steroids. They're, they're an extortion racket. They extort everything that walks, whether it be business, whether it be NGOs, whether it be the government so that some percentage of that money was being shared with them. The second question that I asked that she didn't understand was, um, are Kandaharians, um, are, are the inhabitants of Kandahar joining the Afri Afghan National Army? And she was puzzled by that. She said that they support it, but they're not joining it. They don't want their children to join it. So that, that, that did not register with it. And so. The Afghan National Army was uh, did not did not participate in the nation building exercise. It did not get off the get off the ground, and the leadership was was largely failed and patronage based. So I think those three things, um, and not trying to build a strong uh, central state that tied to control all aspects of all of all aspects of governance. And so one of the, the, the failures that was laid to Ghani, who ironically was an expert on failed states and wrote a book on failed states, was that everything that he did was a textbook example of how to create a failed state. So those are three things. And the other thing I would have said would, would have been to put pressure on Pakistan because the, the, the Taliban, and that I, I know that that happened, but it wasn't successful. And so there are two imperial projects. There's one that you know, Western um, leftists point to as American imperialism, and then there's the imperialism of Pakistan, which succeeded on two on two two occasions. So uh, on the previous occasion, they they defeated along with their mujahideen the Soviets in, in in Afghanistan, and they the the Pakistani military and the ICI referred to the the Taliban as their boys. So it was not without they could not have done this without Pakistani military support. They provided the military um, uh, tools, they provided them um, the night scopes, the IED devices, um, they provided safe shelter. So their families were cloistered or sheltered in places like Quetta, which is also a province where you have an insurgency, a secular nationalist insurgency fighting against the national state that's been brutally suppressed. So the Pakistan military had no problem crushing an internal threat, but allowed this to flourish. So I think that those would be the 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 the, the kind of big picture items. And then yeah. there's also the question of how did the Taliban financially survive? So I mentioned the Sicilian mafia example. There's also the heroin drug trade. Okay. So so you know you, there's one part of it that's the military part. Then there's the other, you know, they need finances to, to, to survive. So something that kind of brought them into the tent, something that kind of minimized their ability to successfully use violence and to fund that violence. Um, I, that's just really, hindsight is always, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, those are good. Those are good. I and mean, look, th there's so much to unpack here and we'll be debating what went wrong and what could have, but what could have, what could have been done better um, for many years to come. I hope we're having that conversation in the United States. Um, but with time quickly fleeting, let me just go through a series of rapid questions because I want to give this patient audience a chance to weigh in. Uh, you alluded to this in your introductory remarks. Um, what do you make, I mean, how skeptical should we be of the Taliban's purported new moderation? Um, obviously, no one takes it at face value. But from my perspective, there, are, there have been not just rhetorical shifts, um, but clearly changes on the ground. Now there's counter evidence that one can point to, but this is clearly uh, not the Taliban of the late 1990s in terms of the leadership. There is a sense that it's much more sophisticated, that it wants international recognition, that it's talking in ways that it never did in the 1990s about amnesty, about integration, rep representing all Afghans. Um, on the question of persecution of minorities, where the Taliban is notorious, um, you know, 
there is that amnesty report of a massacre against Shia in Ghazni province that took place in July. But at the same time, you know, the Islamic Shia holy month of Muharram just took place. And we have images and reports of the Taliban um, not only not interfering to stop those Shia religious ceremonies, but actually protecting them and participating in them. So clearly there's, you know, there, there are shifts that have taken place. The question is how how genuine are they and how um, how skeptical should we really be when it comes to dealing with this uh, so-called Taliban 2.0? Could you say a bit more on that? Um, so first, I'm going to kind of slice that onion sociologically. So when I think about shifts in the Taliban, we have to think about this as a, a multi-generational organization. So the first generation fought the Soviets, right? The second generation came of age during 9-11 and um, uh, we're, we're more or less, you know, kind of, um, the spearhead of, of, of the, the, the Taliban insurgency. The third generation, which is the 18, 19, and 20-something-year-old, those are the, the, the young males that are committing most of the violence. So it's not the, the second generation, but the young that feel that they, it's their right to rule. They want it all, and they can do what they want. So this becomes a question of how the Taliban will, will organize in the future and how those on, on, on the margins that want to use violence will, will, will respond and how they will behave. So I'll give you a couple of examples of why I'm slightly skeptical. I'm hope that I'm proving completely wrong, but um, when, the, when the, the Taliban came into power, not came into power, but came into power in that they opened the prisons, um, they released some 2,300 um, Tariki Taliban, um, Pakistani Taliban, and let them go. And so the Pakistanis have come back and said to the Afghan Taliban, look, these are very bad people. We, we want them handed over. And the Afghan Taliban said no. So um, there's also the relationship between uh, Islamic State, which is kind of a peripheral organization, and also Al-Qaeda. So what I'm trying to say is that there's the, the exercise in political inclusion that you pointed to, which are reassuring, but then from a, from a kind of uh, organizational perspective, there are pieces of this organization that have used violence. So how they will respond and react and be brought into control will become really important. So uh, in terms of a future Taliban government, um, there's a guy that uh, 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 an academic at uh, who used to teach at LSC, his name is Antonio Gustazi, and I, I like him a lot. And he's talked about a future Taliban government, and he, he, he threw out some names. So he's mentioned former Foreign Minister Rabani, um, or possibly foreign, former President Karzai, the former Deputy President uh, Krim Khalili, and also, you know, uh, some scary names from the past, such as Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, will be represented or their associates or their organizations within the government. So they've been trying to get middle-level technocratic bureaucrats to remain uh, in their positions so that they can govern. But really what it'll be important to see what happens, what the contours of the government is or, and who participates and who doesn't participate mm -hmm. and only time can tell. I, I hope that they, that they're, they're, that they moderate and move in, um, in, in a way of, of inclusion so that they don't have an angry majority that is resisting them every step of the way and that they use more barbaric violence. Yeah, let, let me share with you one thought and get your reaction on the, um, the regional fallout from this disaster and how it's gonna affect other Muslim majority societies. One of the um, big concerns that I have is that other Muslim majority societies are going to look at the Taliban victory and they're going to gain sustenance from it and encouragement from it. And I'm speaking specifically of violent, militant, uh, undemocratic, uh, angry, um, um, uh, violence prone organizations. They're going to say, look, we don't need uh, democracy. We don't need the ballot box. We need armed struggle. We need resistance. We need to be steadfast. The Taliban fought for 20 years and now they've marched into Kabul and even the US you know, army has to sort of beg them for mercy. Uh, we can emulate them. And so the, the, one of the fallouts that I deeply fear is that the voices of um, nonviolence, of moderation, of democracy in the Islamic world are gonna take a huge hit
because of this development and the voices of extremism, radicalism, violence are going to say, look, you know, uh, the Taliban is, is, is a role model that's worth, worth emulating. And if you look at the statements that have been already put out by these militant organizations in different parts of the you know, Arab world in, in, in particular, that's exactly what they're saying. Do you share the same concern, Imran? Um, I, I think I, I'm gonna, my concern is only shared within the neighborhood of Afghanistan. And so um, you remember I alluded to the Pakistani Taliban, which are called the Tariq Taliban. And so um, there is a, there's a, a, a full-blown uh, Taliban insurgency in Pakistan that's killed thousands of people over the past 20 years. And the military has tolerated it because it views it as a tool that it can use in India and Kashmir. So, mm -hmm. so this, this is something that's, um, that's materialized in Pakistan. And, 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 and the Pakistani Taliban congratulated the Afghan Taliban and, and said that we wish for the same victory um, uh, against the Kufar in Pakistan. So Iqbal Ahmed repeatedly warned Pakistan that this is a very grave threat, and, and as he put it, um, uh, to, to Pakistani military uh, intelligence types that kind of wanted this to happen in Afghanistan, that the chickens will come home to roost. And, and they have. And so... Um, don't forget that it was the, the Pakistani Taliban that shot Malala Yousafzai in 2009 in SWAT. She was 15 years old and she was a schoolgirl. And, and the question is, what crime did she commit? And she wrote a blog that, that criticized the Taliban for their views on girls' education. So the, the Pakistani Taliban are, are empowered. They, they feel that, that they can kick the facade of a of a corrupt uh, secular state down and and and, and construct a, a similar emirat in, 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 in Pakistan, and so this is a very real fear because um, if you look at the the numbers from the um, there's there's a, a a program at Brown University that kind of looks at uh, war fatalities, uh, the cost of war, and I looked at the numbers for Afghanistan and Pakistan, and what shocked me was more journalists have died in Pakistan than Afghanistan. So they've died at the hands of two groups of, uh, of actors, the military, uh, surreptitiously, and non-state actors. So um, Pakistan's in real danger. Uh, the, the, the military prefers uh, militant jihadis to mainstream political parties that they can't control and can't, uh, a democracy is messy. And if you have Democrats that want to cut your budget, and you want you to have, negotiate peace with India, then you you try to put them into a box. So the way to do that is to 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 do what they've done to overthrow democratically elected governments, but also to have more violent voices on the margins that say that you know this these are kufar people, this is the dunya, and we need to have an Islamic state. And so. Um, I, I don't feel that this will be replicated in the in MENA and Middle East, North Africa. There we have a Praetorian Guard, a military class that's ruthless, that will not share power with anyone. I think it's more of a fear within uh, the region of Pakistan. And um, right. and if you thought that Afghanistan was bad with the Taliban government, it's the, the, the apocalyptic nightmare scenario is Pakistan. Right. Let, let's go to the questions because, you know, I'm told that Zoom events should only last an hour or else you're going to put people to sleep or they'll leave. So one of the questions um, uh, is, you know, has Afghanistan ever had a cohesive country with uh, people who, that desired and sort of adhered to a central government? And let me just put a twist on that because it's, it's, it's related to these foundational challenges that Afghanistan posed for the United States. And it goes like this. Look, Afghanistan existed as a country on paper, but identities were fundamentally, for the, mo for the most part, for most Afghanis, they were local identities. They were tribal identities. They were ethnic identities. The number of Afghans that were willing to, you know, uh, identify with the Afghan state, join an Afghan army, an Af a, a new Afghan government, was very few and far between. I mean, this is one of the most underdeveloped, war-ravaged, traditional societies on the planet. So any attempt at nation building or at state building has to deal with this fundamental reality that we're starting um, with uh, a very poor 
um, uh, you know, a very poor deck of cards that had been dealt to us, uh, thus posing immense challenges just from that reality in and of itself. And it's an open question to what extent over the last 20 years, uh, identities um, uh, modernized where people uh, started to identify with a central uh, government and would jettison their more tribal, ethnic and sectarian identities. Could you comment? Um, that's, that's a difficult question because it really speaks to um, historically when we think about these things about how we think of identity, national identity. And so, you know, Benedict Anderson wrote, about, wrote a book on this. And so when we look at this comparatively, this is a slow and evolving process. It's not something that happens in five or 10 years or 20 years. And so, you know, my, um, my timelines would be 50 to 100 years. And so when we, when we look at the voter participation numbers for the last election in 2019, it was roughly around 10%. So if the population of Afghanistan is 38 million, 3.8 million people voted. And so these are, these are slow processes that evolve over time. And as the state entrenches and is able to meet the needs of its citizens, then the identification starts to uh, uh, subsume local identities. But, but, but the question really is, do we want to subsume local identities? So if you're a Hazara, you're an Uzbek or Tajik, we don't want these ethnic or local identities to be subsumed. We, we want them in some plural or federated manner to exist. So it, it depends I would say it's too well, We want a national okay. identity. That's the point, right? We, we have well, no problem with local regional identities, but there has to be that national identity like there are in all modern, you know, democracies or societies. That's the point. Yeah, but what I'm trying to say is that evolves over time. It's like if you were to take every state that existed and at the 20, 20 year mark ask right after the French Revolution, um, mm -hmm. uh, do you identify more with the Ancien Regime? or with the Republicans, uh, I, I think you would have a similar answer. Right. The only place where it's changed is in totalitarian states and societies, like in, in Maoist China, where they literally uh, engaged in a cultural revolution, and engaged in massive murder, So, or Stalin, uh, Stalinist uh, Soviet Union. So the only place where, it, or, 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 or the Nazi regime, which cre created a unitary identity uh, based on the extermination of the other. So that's where the other extreme goes. So the question is, uh, the answer for me, it's, it's too early to tell. And, and that you could have very easily had a federated identity that kind of coexists with, with, with plural uh, regional and ethnic identities. Right. So one of the questions that emerges in the chat, it's a common one that I think many um, uh, decent Americans, decent members of the global community have right now is, what can the United States do? What can the world do? Uh, what can Canada do to help those educated Afghan women who did benefit from the last 20 years? They got an education, they had jobs, and now they are left at the mercy of the Taliban. Um, do you have any thoughts on what the international, international community can do to help this segment of, of Afghan society? That's a really great question. And I feel somewhat remiss that I didn't really touch upon um, the plight of women and the Taliban. And so, um, our, our mutual mentor, Iqbal Ahmed, had written about them. And he had written about how um, 25 years ago, how the Taliban claims their precepts. I'll answer the question, but I want to provide a little bit of a backdrop on the Taliban and, and their use of an Islamic moniker, is that what he saw happening was using cultural practices and norms that occurred in a tribal setting and conflating them with with Islamic religious norms. And so, um, so he, he really challenged the idea that that was um, rooted in some sort of form of Islamic dogma that they were just repeating. So that's the first thing I'll throw out there. And so even over the last five or 10 years, you have Muslim feminists that have been challenging these misogynist readings. So in terms of supporting Afghan girls and women, that's a really tough and good question you you have you have you have a taliban which is fundamentally a misogynist organization in power and so i, I think that the leverage points are really um financial donations and, and ensuring that 
education continues and that their access to health care and that their access to participate in society, in the workplace for education, for health care uh, is not severely impeded or destroyed like it was when the Taliban came to power 1996 to 2001, where they were literally beaten and you know confined to 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 their homes. So um, I, I think that the answer is really um, going to be based upon um, financial coercion to 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 move them in a particular direction. And also, I'm going to also suggest that it could very well be that we see resistance from Afghan women and girls. So we've seen images of, of, of brave, brave Afghan girls and women challenging Taliban fighters in the streets of Kabul. So if we see an eruption of hundreds of thousands of Afghans protesting and fighting and resisting nonviolently the Taliban, it might challenge their their ability to 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 engage in these practices i i think it's an open question right now for me i i, I think we want to do what we can do to support it and one of the, the the things that really impressed me were you know um afghan girls and women and, and their their desire for education in the post-taliban era um, just as a sidebar um the 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 high standing in the university entrance exams that have appeared for, for you know, students applying to university in, Af in, in Afghanistan were girls for the past few years. And there's this kind of very iconic moment a few years ago when there was a, an Afghan girls robotic team that wanted to compete in an American competition and couldn't. And there was a, a sad um, update that they had fled the country and has seeked asylum in Mexico. So um, one of the things that's happening is that um, the people that are leaving are the, are, the, are, are the best and the brightest. They're the educated, they're the doctors, the, the technocrats, the economists, um, the people that, the journalists, the people that would have provided the, 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 the intelligentsia for, for, for our government and for our society. So we, we've lost a lot of really, really smart young men and women. And so uh, they've been lost. So the question is, how can we prevent uh, a further backsliding into the era of 1996 and 2001? I also think that there's a role for Muslim countries to play to put pressure on, 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 um, on, um, on the Taliban so that, you know, that Pakistan is uh, taken by the cuff from the World Bank and the IMF and said, if the Taliban engage in these practices, you know, we're not going to be giving you your World Bank loans. We're going to make them conditional. I, I, I realize this is a... You know, Imran, let me just push back on that. Argument. Let me just push back on that point. Uh, I didn't want to say this, but you provoked me. Uh, given the Muslim world's reaction to the genocide of the Uyghurs, uh, put me in the skeptical camp that any Muslim government or leader is going to do anything ethical or principled on the question of human rights in Afghanistan. Care to comment? It's a fair point. I, I mean, like that brings us to China, right? And so China, right. um, the first place, this is an interesting observation. The first place the Taliban flew out of the country to outside of Doha was they went to Tianjin, China to meet with the foreign minister. And they made nice with the, the Chinese foreign minister and said that, you know, we, we, want, um, we want to have good relations. And so there's a visiting Taliban um, delegation that included uh, Mullah Abdul Baradar. And so this was about as high level as it gets. And so China is going to play an increasingly large role and they want access to um, uh, Afghanistan's incredible mineral wealth. And they also want to have access to uh, Uyghurs that have fled uh, um, China and uh, are, are, are seeking refuge in Afghanistan and they want to bring them back to uh, Chinese concentration camps. So you're, you're, you made a very valid point, but I think that um, the, the actions of the Taliban in terms of engaging in a form of gender apartheid against half of society has produced a visceral backlash in Muslim women across the Muslim world. And so there is 
uh, there is a, a kind of angry community of, of, of people that, of, of men and women, particularly women that will want to, 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 to help their sisters uh, achieve some semblance of legitimate rights. So I, I think that it may not be the states, it may be civil society, but um, I, I think there's a role for Muslims to say, uh, not in the name of Islam, and that this has nothing to do with us, and that you're an anathema. So we haven't seen that happen. We may not see that happen, but th that may be something um, that's a card that's that could be played. Yeah, perhaps so, by um, Muslim organizations living in free societies that are not under the yoke of an authoritarian regime that um, you know dictates what. Um, people can say and not say. So I think there's a big role here since we're speaking to a largely American audience and many um, American and Canadian Muslims are watching in that there is, I think, a role for those organizations to play. But fundamentally, I would just add to what you said on how we can best help Afghan women. Uh, we're in a period of transition, but once things sort of solidify um, uh, and become more clear in the coming months, the rule of thumb that I always use when it comes to these questions of how can we best help another group of people living in dire conditions is don't presuppose um, in advance that we know what the answers are. Uh, listen to those uh, organically connected, democratically engaged, responsible activists on the ground who can um, best tell us what they need from uh, the international community. That's just a rule of thumb that applies not just to Afghanistan and Afghan women, but I think to just human rights causes everywhere around the world. So that's my two cents worth on yeah, so that topic. I, I don't think I disagree, but I, I think also that um, into this um, equation or into this mix or this cocktail, you have 3.5 million internally displaced and another 270,000 that have been displaced. So th this is, a, these are a great number of internally displaced refugees. And so um, the UNHCR wrote and said that the resilience of the Afghan people has been pushed to the limit, both by displacement, COVID disasters, and drought and poverty. So um, I think that um, this is a deeply traumatized society. And so we'll have to figure out ways of engagement uh, that, that kind of bypass um, the, the, the jailers uh, of the Taliban. So yeah, it's a huge challenge. I mean, there's no easy answers. I mean, the obvious one you pointed to already, it's clear that at least sections of the Taliban want international legitimacy, recognition, um, you know, uh, acknowledgement, et cetera. So the obvious thing to do would be to tie any sort of um, humanitarian aid, foreign aid, um, support and sustenance to human rights conditionality. Um, I have no hope that it'll work or that the Afghan Taliban are going to, you know, agree to those terms. But, you know, that seems to be one area where we have leverage. Although, you know, what I just said is very controversial because I don't want to tie humanitarian aid, you know, for starving people who are living um, on the margins of existence to, you know, uh, certain compliance from the, the oppressive rulers that rule over them, because that could have dire consequences. But that broadly speaking, I think is the way forward, unless anyone else has any other ideas. Uh, there, there, there is the sense also that there are some countries that have influence over the Taliban. Clearly Pakistan, not sure whether Imran Khan wants to use it in a constructive way, but clearly Qatar does. Uh, and before, for those people who know the history. Level. Yeah, Iran, Iran. Well, I mean, that's that's a good question. We'd have to have another program. Uh, I think my own reading is that the relations are have improved, but they're still very cold given past grievances. I'm not sure how much influence Tehran has over the Taliban, but, you know, the three countries that recognized the first iteration of the Taliban government in the late 1990s was Pakistan, the Emirates, and Saudi Arabia. So um, I, I don't respect any of those. Um, ruling elites. I don't have any hope that they might do anything constructive, but the, the point here is, is that those countries that at least have some influence over the Taliban might be able to at least act as a um, act as a facilitator or a mediator in terms of conveying demands that the international community has of the Taliban in terms of um, good conduct. So I think that brings it to the end, Emron. Any final thoughts? Because I want to wrap it up soon and turn it back to Ismail. Um, no, I mean, these are all good questions. And um, 
there's no answer. We, we don't really know where this is uncharted territory. And it could very well be that the Taliban do not rise to the challenge of governance, do not moderate. And it, they yeah. could end up being a failed state. Yeah, uh, which just opens the door, sure. right? Opens the door for, you know, failed states attract radical extremist militant organizations exactly as they did, you know, in the late 90s that, you know, led to the events of 9-11. So the prognosis doesn't look good. I mean, the point here is that the world has an interest in not ensuring and not and making sure that Afghan doesn't, Afghanistan doesn't deteriorate further, that they're not more refugees, that there's some sort of semblance of some, you know, political order else, you know, the beneficiaries are Al-Qaeda, um, ISIS, and other uh, similar minded groups. Yeah, so the last thing on the note of refugees, so Europe, the European Union's desperately wanting to avoid another, you know, long corridor of refugees from Afghanistan. They don't want millions of Afghan refugees, the Pakistanis, the Iranians don't. And right. so um, there's there's going to be some desire to, to, to really um, engage with from a point of leverage with this regime. So we'll just have to stay tuned. Okay, Emron, great talking to you. Thanks for your insights. Um, this topic is not going away, so there might be an opportunity in, in perhaps uh, a few weeks down the road to do a, a part two of this uh, conversation. Um, thanks for taking the time to, to, to um, be with us. The other point is that there yeah. are also um, across the United States a lot of you know um, academics and, and, and actors that have participated on the ground that in Afghan voices as well, that will be really, really important to, to hear what they say. So uh, part two might be um, having Afghan voices that are, you know, like um, some of these journalists that are being covering the ground to, to kind of participate and, and kind of provide some insight uh, in what's going on. Great, Thank great, you. great suggestion. Thanks, Imran. And, and Ismail, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nader Hashemi and uh, Imran Qureshi. Um, thank you for sharing your wisdom, your insights, and enlightening us about the complex situation that we are from the distance witnessing. Um, it is very complex and difficult. We hope and pray that the situation will develop for the better for the wonderful people of um, Afghanistan. Um, if you would like to help um, the people of Afghanistan who are heading to Colorado, you can make a contribution um, to um, our organization and we will ex um, make sure that the money is going to hand over to um, the Afghan refugees here in Colorado. And if you would like to join our events in the future, um, you can sign up on our website. And um, for a 2.0, we would be very interested in organizing a 2.0 on this um, um, very important discussion in the future. So um, stay tuned, um, have a wonderful evening, and um, hope to see our um, friends again online. Thank you and stay healthy.